good afternoon everybody today's uh, guest lecture is on soil quality versus sustainable agriculture and our guest speaker is uh, dr bidari i welcome all the staff and students who are present online and offline for this uh, guest lecture uh, i like to introduce our guest speaker he is dr bidari professor and head uas darwat sir has retired just a month before he has started his career as assistant professor in uas darwat in the year 1987 and after that he is elevated to the professor post of associate professor professor and professor and head in the same university and after the assumption of professor and head he has also worked as university head for the entire department of soil science it is a very specific thing regard to uh, uas darwat because usually we have only professor and head for department but in that university is a peculiar thing for the whole university for all the departments there is a head for soil science so he is he was heading that department it is a, a very big task and uh, he uh, he has uh, uh, worked on the waste utilization projects his uh, favorite crop is chili in which he has concentrated his research work he has published 42 articles books and books chapters and then he has guided 18 msc students and 3 phd students and during his uh, tenure he visited several countries like germany belgium italy france thailand malaysia sweden netherlands and finland so this is when when i was talking with our uh, guest speaker in the morning uh, telling about uh, this uh, our customary guest lecture after the conduct of uh, final viva was sir was very much appreciating tnau's initiative uh, of this guest lecture so all this credit goes to our vice chancellor and uh, pg dean uh, so he was also very much overwhelmed to present this lecture today sir i request you to uh, conduct this lecture sir respected uh, dean of the college of agriculture and my close friend dr mahendra and uh, respected head of the department dr shiba and uh, from uh, at the gesture of uh, dr bakita soli i am here to present the uh, my guest lecture and i am thankful to uh, selia for uh, inviting me to conduct the final rovers examination of uh, mr santil kumar it is an occasion to visit uh, madurai i am visiting madurai for the first time okay i visited uh, coimbatore two three times when dr rani permal and dr selva kumari were the heads of the department long back so this is the first time visiting madurai city of uh, temples right okay okay thank you so today's my guest lecture is on uh, soil quality and uh, versus uh, sustainable agriculture so before we go for uh, the definition of the soil quality and the soil health uh, let us have some overlook about this uh, food grain production in india if you glance this uh, slide uh, i've taken it from the google okay uh, food grain production is goes uh, has gone on increasing from 1950 51 we were producing only 50.8 million tons and uh, during 1923 april last month uh, it was only 300 and uh, it was a uh, 315.7 million tons almost uh, seven times we have increased our uh, food grain production and uh, the projection during 1925 is a uh, 3 we, we we need to produce 338 million tons and by 2050 we need to produce uh, 480 million tons so almost uh, about uh, uh, five times that is almost it is approaching to 500 million tons from right from the independence then you go on you go on seeing the population it is also increasing recently we have seen in all the newspapers we have surpassed we have surpassed china in population now so by 2025 the population will be around 156 146 crores and by 2050 it will be 175 crores and by 2023 april it is 142 crores now so during a 50 51 it was hardly 36 crores okay yeah? and let us come to the land degradation it is also increasing population is increasing food grain production is also increasing and the land degradation is also increasing so by 2023 the extent of land degradation is around 130 million hectares and by 2025 it is 135 and by 2050 the projection it is 147 million hectares in fact the land degradation has to come down but it is Goes on, goes on increasing now, right? 
Then let us come to this uh, productivity growth rate of important crops. I will not take much time because uh, it is already time is already over now. All are hungry, I think. Okay. So what is the annual growth growth rate of our uh, growth rate in productivity now with respect to these different crops? Rice, wheat, then pulses, total food grains, oil seeds, non food grains, then all principal crops. So it is all in uh, decades. So 1980 to 1990, 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2020 it is. So it is in, uh, if you come to this 2000 to 2020, the figures are in the uh, negative side. Means uh, the productivity growth rate of some of the crops is decreasing now. So we are getting uh, a serious problem of uh, food grain production in future. Now let us come to this uh, extent of yield reduction due to soil degradation. What is the extent of soil degradation? Or what is the extent of yield reduction? If you come to normal soil, there will be reduction in the yield to the extent of 2 to 5 percent. It is mainly due to climatic factors, excess rainfall or deficit rainfall or very high temperature, sunshine and other things. Then in case of saline soil, the extent is to the extent of 20 to 25 percent. Alkali soil, 35 to 40 percent. Then acid soil, 30 to 35 percent. Calcareous soil, 15 to 20 percent. Waterlogged soil, it is to the extent of 50 to 60 percent, except paddy. None of the crops can be grown uh, in a waterlogged soil. Then polluted soil 25 to 30 percent. So, in all these uh, poor soils, there will be reduction in the yield in spite of adopting uh, good management practices. Then let us come to extent of reduction in food quality in some of the salt affected soils. The previous slide was with respect to total yield. This is with respect to food quality in some of the salt affected soils. If you come to any of the figures here, there will be reduction in the carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, crude fibers, and water. Then wheat. The reduction in the yield, reduction in the quality of uh, wheat, that is protein content is to the extent of 8 to 10 percent. If you come to maize, there will be reduction in the quality of uh, carbohydrates to the extent of 10 to 12 percent. Then groundnut, 10 to 15 percent in case of lipids, that is oil content. Soybean, 10 to 15 percent in case of proteins. Cotton, seeds, barley, 10 to 15 percent in case of crude fibers. Then chickpea, 15 to 20 percent in case of proteins. So, what I want to say is, in salt affected soils, there will be reduction in the food quality also. There will be reduction in the yield also. Then decrease in per capita availability of the land. If you look to this uh, decrease in the per capita availability of the land from 1951 to 2000, 2025 and 2050, population is increasing. Per capita availability of land is also decreasing now. By 2025, the net zone area will be 0.11 and the per capita availability by 2050 will be 0.09 hectares. So, due to population rise, there will be decrease in the per capita availability of the land also. Of course, these are all the percentage of various land uses of the reported area. Just I will just skip off this one. Then classification of the degraded lands. So, water erosion, wind erosion, salinity, acidification erosion, waterlogged soil, alkalinity. Then what are the consequences of this soil erosion now? The soil loss per year, per year is around 6,000 metric tons. Then nutrient loss per year is around 5.6 to 8.4 metric tons. Then food production loss per year is 30 to 40 metric tons because of uh, degrade lines. Then soil loss per unit area is around 16.3 tons per hectare per year. So every year we are losing around 16 tons of uh, soil per hectare because of this uh, uh, erosion and other things. Then let us come to this uh, projected food grain production in relation to nutrient consumption and removal and gap. If you look to this, uh, this one, the nutrient removal and nutrient gap. Nutrient removal is much more than the nutrient gap. Plants are taking or the due to intensive agriculture, high yielding varieties, hybrids. They are taking the same amount of nutrients from the soil, but we are not replenishing the soil with the same amount of nutrients. There is a big gap in the bar diagrams there. Nutrient removal and nutrient gap it is. Nutrient removal is much more than the nutrient added through fertilizers or through organic means. Of course, sir, this is one more. Then let us come to this uh, soil quality now. So what is this, uh, what do you mean by the term soil quality? Of course, there is a mistake here, but it should be 1885. The concept of soil quality was first highlighted in 1885 by Rafael Pampli about 137 years ago. He described soil as an anti-chamber of life. It is not a chamber of life, it is anti-chamber of life. The nature's laboratory in which operates continuously some processes that prepares the inert matter for the nourishment of life. It establishes connection between human health and soil, water, and air. Soil works as an organism or a system, and human life is part of the system. We are all part of the life. We are all part of the soil system. 
So he gave that definition. He gave the definition as continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living system within ecosystem and land use boundaries to sustain biological productivity, maintain the quality of air, water, and promote plant, animal, and human health. So this definition is the latest definition given by Doron et al. in the year 1986. Now the question is, what is the difference between soil quality and soil health? Then the two terms are used synonymously, but technically the two terms are different. We say that soil health. When we say that soil health is deteriorated, it means to say that soil quality is also deteriorated. We ascertain soil health from the point of soil quality only. So what is soil quality? It is the sum of physical, chemical, and biological properties. So soil condition is influenced by management factors, then your uh, your atmospheric factors, then uh, your soil health. That is specific bent for condition of the soil. So soil health means it is an interactive influence of inherent soil properties, environmental factors, as well as your management practices. So management practices, environmental factors, and the inherent soil properties they determine the soil health. In turn. You measure the soil quality indicators, physical indicators, chemical or the biological indicators. If there is severe deviation in the physical, chemical or the biological indicators, the soil health is affected. It is just like a temperature and heat. How you say that the soil is heated? You have to measure the temperature, right? So temperature is the manifestation of the soil health. If there is high high soil temperature, means there is high soil health. So that is the question of this. Uh, that is the meaning of the soil health and the soil quality. You measure soil quality from the point of soil. Okay, that's right. Of course, this is all. Uh, what are the reasons for deterioration of the soil quality or the soil health? One is widespread soil erosion. Then, second one is imbalanced nutrient use. Yes, this is very important. Imbalanced nutrient use. I told in the previous slide, nutrient removal is much more than the nutrient added. That is one. Then, change in land man ratio over years. You have seen the per capita availability of land is going down. Then, nutrient mining, rapid urbanization, industrialization. These are all some of the reasons for this. Uh, Soil quality deterioration. Of course, uh, this is one. Uh, the purpose is imbalanced nutrient use. I have told it in the previous slide. You can see the consumption ratio of fertilizer nutrients in the India now. The ideal ratio given by the Indian Council of Agriculture Research is four is to two is to one. When you go for this uh, 2020-21, it is 9.5 is to 1.5 is to one. We are using more amount of nitrogen, very less amount of phosphorus and the potassium during new during uh, 1920. It was 10.5 is to 2.5 is to 1. So there is an imbalanced uh, nutrient ratios here. We are using more and more amount of nitrogen, less amount of phosphorus, and less amount of potassium. What is the significance of this nutrient ratio? Because plants take up nutrients in a particular ratio. Under optimum ratio, there will be maximum uptake of nitrogen, phosphorus, and the potassium. But you have altered this ratio. You have not maintained the proper ratio. Proper ratio is 4 is to 2 is to 1, irrespective of the crops or irrespective of the soil. But you have severely deviated this nutrient ratio. Then let us come to this. Uh, what are the types of soil quality? Right. So there are two types of soil quality: inherent and the dynamic soil quality, or the kinetic soil quality, by which is influenced by the management practices. Then inherent soil quality, it is nothing but genetic soil quality. It is influenced by the soil forming factors that all knows, genetic factors. Then these are some of the soil quality classes and types of soil resources. So there are totally six classes: very high, high, moderate, then low, very low, like that. So when you say that the soil called class is very high, soils having molic horizon, molic horizon means a soft horizon, then uh, lacking silic and fulvic properties, then chernogems, chestnuts, they are all soils developed on sandstone having an agric V horizon, soils which are coarser than sandy loam to depth, sandy loam to depth of at least 100 cm. Soil depth is the major uh, factor here. So when soil depth is very high, root proliferation will be high, uptake of nutrients will also be very high. Then you have got a very high soil quality. So soils showing clay properties, then histosols. Soils having silic properties under natural conditions. So this is having uh, a very high soil quality parameters. High quality soils developed on limestones having agric horizon, lacking a molic horizon. So if there is a molic horizon, it is having a very high soil quality. If there is a lack of molic horizon, it is having a high soil quality. Then soils developed on sandstone having a cambic B horizon and other things. Then moderate soils developed on limestones, unconsolidated materials having a cambic B horizon. So these are all uh, so low and very low. So soils developed on limestone or underdeveloped materials having a A horizon, then soil depth is the major concern here. There is very shallow soils. Then let us come to this uh, soil quality indicators. Of course, uh, in the previous uh, presentation, Dr. Uh, Santil Kumar 
told that physical indicators, chemical indicators, and the biological indicators. How you assess, how you ascertain the soil quality indicators then? That is indicated by the soil quality index, SQI. Methods of assessment, delineation of key indicators and the related soil functions, transformation of indicators into a single value. Of course, sir, this is one that I've taken from the Indian Journal of Fertilizers. That is soil quality index, then scoring and the functions. So soil quality index is equal to WISI, sigma, physical indicators, chemical indicators, and the biological indicators. So it is indicated by, that's just normally told, weight assigned to the indicator, score of that indicator, soil quality indicator is used for evaluating soil management options. For example, if the soil quality index value is low, it is usually low for N plus F5. It is medium for NP plus F5. It is high for NPK plus F5. It is lowest for only F5. So what is the significance of the soil quality index then? That gives a high means NPK plus F1, means balanced fertilization along with organics. Only organics it is lowest. It is medium for NP plus F5. It is very low for N plus F5. So only F5 supplies only limited quantity of nutrients very slowly, in small quantity. Then soil quality index will be very low, but no doubt the physical indicators will be very high. But what about the nutrient supplying capacity to meet the plant requirement? It is very low. SQI includes all the physical, chemical, and biological. Yes, yes, yes. It includes all physical, chemical, and the biological parameters. But the release of nutrients by the FI will be very slow. Only physical properties will be employed, will, will be improved there. So if the soil is already low in uh, nutrient content, then again it will be low only. That is the concept. So these are some of the statistical methods used for uh, assessing the soil quality index. Factor analysis, PCA, nonlinear. Linear and multiple degradation analysis, cluster analysis, multiple correlation, star plants, expert opinion method. This is very important. Expert opinion method. He may be a farmer. He may be a scientist. He may be a sensor. So in some of the Western countries, sensors are used as an expert opinion method for assessing the soil quality index. Soil quality index. So measurement of soil quality, indicator parameters selected under the MDS are normalized by scoring function. In the linear scoring technique, indicator values are scored depending upon three different scenarios. For example, if SQI is better, more is better, parameters like organic carbon, microbial biomass carbon, CEC, yes. When organic carbon is high, microbial biomass carbon is high, CEC is high, then definitely SQI will be very high. So these three things should be higher. Then less is better, bulk density should be low. Then EC should be low. ESP should be low. Then optimum is better, pH. Free lime content, clay content. They should be optimum for SQL. Then visual indicators. So physical, chemical, and the biological indicators. Physical, chemical, and biological indicators have to be determined only in the laboratory. But what about these visual indicators? When you visit the field, based on seeing the field, looking at a particular place, you can assess the soil quality. You can assess the soil quality. For example, visual indicators of soil quality and some processes that they impact. Top soil depth, rooting volume of the crop, rooting volume for crop production, then water and nutrient availability. Yes. If there is a very shallow soil, the rooting volume will be restricted. For example, in case of your rock out area, if there is a very hard layer, B2T layer in case of sodic soil. Again, this uh, top soil depth is very important here. Then conductivity or salinity, water infiltration, crop growth, soil structure, then soil surface, erosion. Crusting, yes. Yesterday I visited this, uh, 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 what is that? Hi, uh, Rameshwaram. The problem was soil crusting there. Very low organic matter content. Germination is a major problem because the soils gets hard because of very low, clay, very low organic matter content, very high sand content. So that is the problem. Then minimum data set, data set of physical indicators for screening the soil quality. So soil texture indicates how well water, how well water and chemicals are retained and transported provides an estimate of soil erosion and variability, soil depth and rooting, indicate productivity potential, events out landscape and geographic variability, infiltration in soil bulk density, describes the potential for leaching, soil productivity, erosion, then water holding capacity, describes water retention, transport and erosion, available water. So these are all the physical indicators of the indication of the soil quality. Then uh, this is one infiltration, aggregation, yes. Aggregate stability is very important. That gives a very good uh, measure of the soil structure. You must have a granular and uh, stable soil structure. Granular and stable stru structure. 
erosion resistance, crop emergence, infiltration, all will be influenced by the aggregation. Then bulk density, very high bulk density, the soil will be compacted. Root penetration is a problem. And water and air field spaces and biological activity. So if there is very high bulk density, biological activity will be very low because of uh, poor aeration. That's right. Then chemical indicators of soil quality, that is here there are three parameters here, organic matter, pH, electrical conductivity, and extractable NPK. So these are the three aspects of chemical indicators. Then biological indicators, microbial biomass, carbon, and nitrogen, potential mineralization, N, then soil respiration. So these are the biological indicators uh, that are impacted, that impact the soil quality. Of course, uh, this is one graphical representation of the previous one. So soil quality indicators and their weights and classes for evaluation of the soil quality. So I have told there are five classes. That is class one with class score four. It is having highest. That is very high. Class two with score three. Then class three with score two. Class four with score one. Means uh, it is having a very uh, low product, low soil quality. Of course, this is also one. Then soil quality indicators identified for different soil types and cropping systems and their contributions towards soil quality index. So this is uh, the one I have taken from again from the index journal of fertilizers. So indicators contribution that is given towards SQI. So more than 25%, 15 to 25% and less than 15%. So in case of Varanasi, that is a typical heplostep, sandy loam, then neutrocrept and sandy loam soil. Rice lentil is the cropping system. So less than 15% uh, is contributed by the organic carbon. Available phosphorus contributes uh, 15 to 25%. So in Barakpur, Mohanpura, like that. There is one more uh, new method of assessing the spectroscopic method of our assessment of the soil quality. Soil spectroscopy is an emerging tool for the estimation of different soil properties based on spectral different, uh, reflectance of electromagnetic radiation. So visible, so in this electromagnetic radiation, it uh, starts from uh, your X-rays or it starts from the lowest one, that is gamma rays, and it extends up to infrared rays. That is, it extends up to visible rays and even more, that is radio frequency waves. But in the entire region of electromagnetic spectrum, these three radiations are chosen for your spectroscopy. That is, visible, near infrared, and mid infrared radiations are used for determining the soil properties. In soil spectroscopy, identification and analysis of spectral reflectance in the visible to IR region of electromagnetic spectrum for different soil properties are taken. So, for example, hydro hydroxyl ions of free water and clay lattice and organic matter fractions, functional groups, iron and aluminum oxides and other salts, and, uh, your, uh, and there will be uh, reflectances, they will be correlated with the ground truth data. Based on that reflectance, you are assessing whether what about the clay types, what are the what is the water content, and what are the soil constituents that are developed there. Then soil quality in relation to sustainable development goals. What do you mean by the sustainable development? That is defined by this uh, uh, UN General Assembly. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own demand. That is meaning by sustainable development. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own demand. So that is the meaning of this uh, UN, that is the meaning of this sustainable development. So UN General Assembly has identified 17 sustainable development goals. And in that 17 sustainable development goals, uh, soil is related to four identified goals. Soil is crucial for ending the hunger, that is food production. That is SDG 2 it is, sustainable development goal two that is identified by the UN General Assembly. Then soil is important for good health and well-being. That is STG3. Then soil has a major role in climate action. That is STG13 it is. Then soil has to protect, restore, and promote the environment. That is STG15. So these are the four sustainable development goals uh, that are closely related to soils. That are closely related to soils. So I have given the details. So global hunger, hunger index. 2020 indicates that world is not able to achieve this SDG 2, zero hunger by 2030. What is the meaning of this one? Zero hunger. By 2030, again, there will be shortage of food in the world. Again, there will be shortage of it to feed the population. That is called as a global hunger index. So India ranked 94th among 107 countries, and it is in the serious danger zone. Danger zone. 
category. 14% of Indian population is undernourished and child stunting rate is 37% by 2020 only. So that is the concept here. So India is also in the serious uh, hunger zone. Then SDG 3. Soils are crucial for our food security and nutritional security. And 95% of our food is produced from soils only. And SDG 3 is aims to reduce the number of deaths and illness caused by air, water, and soil pollution and contamination. Then SDG 13, yes, this year we have come to this carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration in soil and reduction of greenhouse gases emissions as a result of best management practices. Then carbon pool of the soil is 1550 petagrams and in organic and 950 petagrams in inorganic form. So atmospheric carbon pool is 800 petagrams. Then SDG 15, to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial systems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, halt land degradation, and biodiversity loss. Here is the question. You have to halt the land degradation and biodiversity loss. Rice wheat system, maize wheat system, cereal followed by cereal, monocropping system in irrigated areas, sugarcane after sugarcane, maize after maize. There is no biodiversity. So you have to adopt a proper crop rotation to avoid this biodiversity loss. And you have to halt this land degradation also. Mismanagement, over irrigation, indiscriminate application of fertilizers, agrochemicals. So all these comes, all these things will come in the SDG 15. Soil plays a major role in food sustainability of the future. 60% of energy needs, carbohydrates of human life are met by three crops, wheat, rice, and veg. These are three important crops that meet 60% of the energy requirement of the people. Then this is one uh, sustainable nutrient management approaches. Of course, uh, Central Kumar has just now told, STCR approach, SSNM approach, DRIS approach, CND approach, then CNC approach, then uh, in B, IPNS, then organic farming and conservation agriculture. So these are the some of the sustainable uh, nutrient management approaches. Then let us come to this organic farming versus soil quality. Higher microbial population, if there is very high organic matter content, there is high microbial population, high soil enzyme activity, increased soil respiration, improved physical and chemical properties, decreased BD by 8%, then improved availability of mineral nutrients. Then this is one uh, question of sustainable ones, how you, mess, how you maintain the soil health to have high carbon sequestration. You have to maintain a very high amount of organic matter in the soil. Indirectly, you are maintaining the soil health also. Right? Now, if you go for this uh, sustainable soil management, if it is 100%, you want to maintain the soil health as usual, okay, as healthy soil. So here you come, that is only farming contributes 25% to the sustainable soil health. The next one is soil health card. Yes, this is very important. In my opinion, soil testing should be made compulsory for the farmers. You have to go for a balanced application of the nutrients based on the soil test values. So when you go for this sustainable soil health, soil management, Organic farming and soil health card means what? Regular application of organic manures along with balanced fertilization of nutrients through fertilizers will play 45% of the maintenance of the soil of the soil health. Other parameters, for example, leaf coated urea, agroforestry policy, then climate programs, NMS, National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture, contingency plans. Contingency plans means uh, in the event of drought or in the event of late receipt of rainfall, alternate crop planning, then NICRA. That is also one project. So these are all government initiatives uh, to achieve sustainable soil management, 100%. Of course, uh, this is one SSNM aspect that I told. Let us not go in. Okay. Of course, no, no need to go. So these are some of the options uh, for enhancing the organic matter content in the rain-fed agriculture. One is improving the quantity and quality of FIM or compost at homesteads. What are the difficulties here? Availability of space at homestead and near cattle soils. Then low moisture levels, low biomass to dung ratio, higher cost of transport of the manure. These are all difficulties uh, that are associated with the FI preparation at the rural level. Then area of action, you have to create awareness and facilitation in the, at the gram per child level and all those things. Then improving the quantity and quality of biomass based manure at farm level. So poor availability of water, lack of compost pits, lack of adequate biomass uh, source, then green manuring, cropping systems, incorporation of crop residues, so these are the major constraints associated. By utilizing these options, you can go for uh, increasing the organic matter content in the rain uh, farming. But what are the major constraints here? So that is also very important here. The number of constraints are there. 
Of course, constant organic manures and vermi composting, high costs, non-availability in some places, then requirement of space with shed vermi composting, labor and water intensity in vermi composting, soil amendments, livestock penning, no organized markets and systems, then mulching and cover crops, low or no tillage, okay, all those things. So let us come to the soil quality versus conservation agriculture. Okay, so what is conservation agriculture? Conservation agriculture has got three basic principles. One is minimum soil disturbance, either zero tillage or the no tillage, or reduced tillage. Then maintenance of permanent soil cover, then diversification of the plant species. If you follow these three basic principles, then you are achieving the objectives of the conservation agriculture. So organic carbon is central to soil fertility and health and quality of the soil. Zero tillage and conservation agriculture have spread to about 1.6 million hectares during 21-22 and it is in the rice wheat cropping system of indo gangetic plains. So now it is a common practice. We have to go for the conservation agriculture, particularly in rice wheat cropping systems of these uh, indo gangetic plains that you have seen in uh, all the news is farmers burn a large amount of uh, wheat residue or the paddy residue, environmental pollution, then uh, and that pollution is spread to Delhi, then a lot of air pollution in Delhi. It is all uh, so why shall we not go for conservation agriculture then? Instead of uh, burning the crop residue, why, why can't you incorporate it in the soil itself? So that uh, it can degrade and add organic matter to the soil. So soil car organic carbon improvement of uh, 170 to 300 kg per hectare per year can be needed noticed in 0 to 30 centimeters top soil layer due to zero tillage in rice wheat cropping systems of indo gangetic plains. Then uh, these are all uh, some of the tables. That is effect of conservation agriculture practice on soil physical properties. For example, bulk density, total porosity, aggregate stability, water holding capacity, and infiltration rate. You can see here in the first one, zero tillage, flat bed, no crop residue on the surface. Last one, zero tillage, raised bed, crop residue on the surface. And above one, zero tillage, raised bed, no crop residue on the surface. So when you keep a crop residue on the surface, there will be improvement in the soil physical properties. Bulk density has reduced, total porosity has increased, aggregate stability has increased, then water holding capacity has increased, infiltration rate has increased. So instead of going for a burning of the crop residue, you incorporate the crop residue in the field only. So that improves the soil physical properties. Then same thing with respect to available nutrients. Last one, zero tillage raised bed crop residue on the surface, 4.48 gram per kg, significant improvement in the organic carbon content when you leave the crop residue on the soil surface. Then available nitrogen, phosphorus, all have increased in the uh, uh, crop residue incorporation. But in case of no crop residue incorporation, they are very low. So instead of uh, going for burning the crop residue, you leave the crop residue and incorporate it in the soil only. Of course, these are all, uh, this is one enzyme activities also. All the three enzyme activities are very high in the raised bed uh, crop residue on the surface. Of course, uh, this is one uh, uh, microbial uh, uh, graphical representation. When there is only one night, when there is only nitrogen, microbial biomass carbon is very low. When you go on increasing with NP, NPK plus FI, the microbial biomass carbon is very high in case of NPK plus FI. And microbial counts are also very high in case of NPK plus FI. So balanced fertilization with FI is best to have higher microbial biomass carbon as well as the microbial counts. Of course, this is also one that is response ratio. Response ratio to the applied nutrient is very high. When you go for NPK plus FI, response ratio to the applied nutrient, that is kg grain per, that is your kg nutrient. Of course, this is one sustainable intensive agriculture. So it takes care of water management, nutrient management, and land management, right? So let us come to this uh, food security, soil security, okay? What is food security? People should have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for their active and healthy life. So this is the definition of the food security that is given by the government. Then what is soil security? This is a new definition given by the IC Act. Maintenance and improvement of soil resource to produce food, fiber, and fresh water, contribute to energy and climate sustainability, and maintain the biodiversity along with overall protection of the ecosystem. So. You have to maintain and improve the soil resource. You have to produce sufficient food, fiber, and fresh water, contribute to energy and climate sustainability. You should not disturb the climate, climate also. That is the meaning. Then what is the economic definition? 
the economic definition is any citizen interested to start agriculture or horticulture or allied activities should have access to fertile and productive land to meet his goal sustainably without altering the components of nature. That is the meaning of soil security. That is economic definition. That one is the technical definition. So this is one uh, soil security, again 100%. So it is uh, related to food security, energy security, ecosystem service, biodiversity protection, climate change abatement, and water security. So you should not uh, disturb the water component. You should not disturb the energy component. You should not disturb the climate. When you go, when you want to maintain the soil security. Okay? Of course, future production systems have to be improved by following five basic principles. Lower greenhouse gas emissions, higher nutrient use efficient, water use efficiency, improved soil quality by recycling organic matter, biomass into the soil, restrict nutrient loss pathway, reduce gap between potential and actual yield activity at farm level. Of course, sir, this is one, uh, what are the effects of soil pollution? Of course, not required, then heavy metals. Then uh, there are three concepts nowadays uh, mooted by the government of India. What are the new frontiers in agriculture? No, three C's, collective farming, contract farming, and corporate farming. So what is collective farming? Farmers having holdings nearby, the, nearby with the same crops join together and take up operations. Okay, so why these uh, three frontiers have come? It is mainly because of labor problem. Okay, and uh, uh, that is resource problems and other economic problems of the farmers. So different size holdings, these are the drawbacks of the collective farming. So number of holdings are there. A farmer will be having one acre, another farmer will be having 10 acres, one acre, two acres, three acres. That is one. Then economic status of the farmers. A farmer will be very poor. He may not go, up, he may not go for the collective farming. Selfishness of the farmers. I have to go for sowing first. I have to go for harvesting first. I have to go for weeding first. That is one. Then climatic aberrations. Yes. Today, all farmers will join together and carry out the operations. Tomorrow, there will be heavy rainfall. So no, we, nobody will go to the field then. The second farmer will be deprived of the facilities. Then soil types of the fields, varied soil types, then resources. Contract farming, agreement with an agro-industry nearby for the purchase of produce at a fixed rate and financing by the industry for the crop production. So what are the drawbacks? Support price fixed by the government may be higher than the agreed price. Farmer will be at the stake. That is one. Then agro-industry will be at risk in the event of drought, excess rainfall, sudden outbreak of pest, diseases. That is one. Then quality of the produce may not meet the standard fixed by the industry. Yes. That is also one drawback of the industry. That is of the, of the uh, industry also. Then last one, corporate farming. So this is a new concept in the agriculture sector now, mooted by the government. Big corporate sectors like Reliance, Tata, Birla, Robert Bosch, Texans, Microsoft, Infosys, Accenture. Now they are slowly entering the sector. They purchase large acres of land near cities or in small towns and take up commercial cultivation of crops for processing. They will set up agro industries, agro based industries nearby towns. Some stories are available in Karnataka. They employ machineries and take up cultivation without much involving manual labor from the nearby villages. So farmers will be unemployed because they use a large amount of machineries for sowing and for harvesting and even for weeding also, mechanization. And the farmers will become slaves to those to these corporate sectors now. Use of polyhouses, mist houses, hydroponics in high-tech horticulture and other things. So in Karnataka recently, Robert Bosch has purchased 250 acres of land near Belgam, about 75 acres, about 75 kilometers away from Darwat. And now they have established in that 250 acres a number of polyhouses and mist houses. And now they are going for cultivation of these roses, then then your cabbage, cauliflower, then your chilies and other things. Then similarly, Accenture has also purchased about 600 acres of land near Miras in Maharashtra. So it has also gone for cultivation of the crops and there's 600 acres of land. Accenture has entered now. So like that, these corporate sectors are entering the agriculture now. Okay. Then this is one concept of a vertical agriculture. Why this vertical agriculture component has come now? A farmer will come and ask a city dweller, why I have to grow crops for you? I am having land. I am growing crops for myself to feed my stomach. Why I have to feed your stomach after staying in the villages with so many odds and uh, climatic conditions and uh, not guarantee of a uh, price by the government? Why I have to grow crops for you? I will not grow crops for you. I will give my land. You come to the village and grow the crops. In that concept, this vertical agriculture has come into picture now. Cultivation of short duration crops, pulses, vegetables, less nutrients and water required crops on rooftops. 
in two or three or even in more tire systems. This will become a common practice in future, particularly by urban drivers. So this has already entered, uh, I've seen in, uh, in some of the multi-story buildings or in some of the apartments in Bangalore. So they are, uh, they are going for this uh, festivals and uh, methane, some of the short duration leafy vegetables on the rooftops only. So this is one uh, statement I, that I've taken. India presents a contrasting picture of one-fifth population chronically hungry at the lower strata. One-fifth of the population is very hungry at the lower level. While at the upper strata, one-fifth consume more or waste food, deploying the food for some people. So in some of the functions, you are seeing large amount of food material will be wasted. This imbalance in food management needs to be corrected strictly with measures like ceiling on food preparation, serving and distribution in marriages, functions, conferences and parties. Allot at least 10% of the unconsumed food for the poorest of the poor. Wasting food is similar to stealing food from poor and hungry people. In some of the Western countries like Netherlands, Finland, Norway, Sweden, etc., fine will be levied wasting food in the hotels. This I have experienced just two months back when I visited Sweden. Okay. So in some of the countries like Japan, Israel, Portugal and Czech Republic, Food will not be served in the functions. Food will be delivered to your home in packets after the function, depending upon the number of adults and children. Food security bill will be meaningful only when such corrective measures are implemented through a law on food wastage. So this is very important. So in my opinion, in, in none of the functions, food should be served. <laughs> because large amount of food will be wasted in the hotels or in the parties. So policy, policy initiatives directed at reducing or eliminating the use of chemical fertilizers will in the long run prove disastrous for Indian agriculture with ever-increasing population having huge requirement of food and meager availability of organic resources. So looking to the, the quantum of uh, organic resources available in India at present, only 25 to 30 percent of the nutrient requirement can be fed by the organic material, organic resources. Pure organic farming is not feasible to India. No. Ours is a tropical climate, subtropical climate. Loss of organic matter is very high. You cannot build up organic matter in India because of tropical climate. I can add a word that the tropical and subtropical climate of India is also not favorable to build up enough organic matter in our soils, like unlike Western temperate countries. Chemical fertilizers have to bear the main burden of supplying plant nutrients to meet the food requirement of increasing population. Fertilizers have to be there. Without fertilizers, you cannot achieve food security to this country. At the same time, you cannot neglect organic farming. So late Dr. P.K. Chonkar, ex-president of ISS, and the legendary soil scientist in FIS seminar told, made a statement uh, during 2003 only. Organic farming may leave many more people hungry in the country if it is practiced exclusively on a large scale. For soil quality, organic farming is very much essential. For food security, chemical fertilizers are required for both organic manure plus chemical fertilizers. So our agriculture is now at the crossroads. Land cannot be expanded. Population is rising at a fast rate. And there is decreasing per capita land resource. It can be concluded that farming without the use of fertilizer field will, will prove disastrous for food security and nutritional security. But balanced use of fertilizers along with organics, I have made the world along with organics board, along with organics, maintains soil quality and achieves food security. Thank you. Okay. So what I want to say here is, uh, nowadays, there is a huge uh, cry that natural farming and organic farming. Yes, natural farming and organic farming are good to maintain the soil quality. But can you achieve food security only through natural farming and organic farming? Chemical fertilizers have to be there. But the thing is, you use these chemical fertilizers on a balanced note, on a balanced scale, on soil testing. That's why I am told, made soil testing compulsory for the farmers. I visited China about uh, 10 years back. Uh, in China, fertilizer is not available in the market unless and until a farmer shows a soil testing card, then only the fertilizer will be given. Soil testing, they have made it very compulsory in China. A farmer, if he wants to purchase a DAP or a MOP or whatever, first he has to show his soil testing card. Then the fertilizer will be given to him. But here it is not like that. So balanced fertilization along with enough amount of organic values are required to achieve nutritional security and food security. At the same time, you are maintaining the soil quality also. So that is the concept. Okay, thank you for your patient hearing. And uh, Dr. Shiva has given me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you people on organic farming as well as nutrition. Second, thank you. I thank our Dean SPGS Kwaimthur 
for uh, giving the opportunity to conduct this uh, guest lecture by the guest speaker from the Darwad. And I thank our Dean Yesendara Madurai for his uh, continuous help for conducting this uh, guest lecture. And I extend my thanks to the this external examiner uh, who has come over here from the Darwad, Dr. B. A. Bidari. Thank you very much, sir, for your guest lecture. And I thank our professor and head department of soils and environment for her involvement in the conduct, conducting of this uh, guest lecture. I thank all our uh, faculty members of the soils and uh, environment. I thank all the students and the PhD and the PG students of the uh, department of soils and environment and other department. Thank you, Onanda. Thank you, sir.